Uh, I'm Catherine Atkins. And um, I'm co-president of the California Writers Club of Long Beach with my buddy, Aline Simons. She's the other president. And she is also... Very good, very good. Um, she's also our treasurer. And Russ Thompson, over here, is our secretary, which is very cool. And um, many of you know this story by heart that some of our visitors might not know that we are an organization that was started in 1909. Yeah. Um, in the Bay Area by uh, some people that were there, including Jack London, who you might have heard of. He was one of the founding members. The club is now um, 22 chapters and about 2,000 members throughout the state. Uh, this particular branch is about 16 years old. 17, 16? 16 16-ish. 16 16-ish. I got, I got an ish, so that's cool. Um, and so our kind of our, our mission is to help writers um, and to help them with their writing and the marketing of their work. So that's what we're about. And part of what we like to do with these meetings, in addition to having great speakers, like Jerry, um, is to ask anybody in the audience if they would like to tell us if they've had something published or if they've had a speech or anything that's kind of writerly that they'd like to tell the group about. It's just in the recent the recent, in the recent, time, recent, yeah. recent past. Just a couple seconds. Yay, Janet, yes? Our next book's coming out in September. Yay, and what is the name of your next book? Number 18. Um, okay, so um, for those of you who don't know, Janet and Will are a married couple, and they're still married, and they've been writing together <laughs> for how many how many books now? Uh, together, six. Six books together, and they're still talking to one another. <laughs> <laughs> the name of the book is Stone Pub. Stone, Stone Pub. Pub. Okay. And it takes place in... Cool. Oh. We are now writing under a pseudonym, E.J. Williams. E.J. Williams. Cool. All right. Thanks, Janet. Yes, did you have another one? Yeah. I have a book. Oh, okay. Come on up. Come on. Uh -huh. Come on. It's just exciting. It's a, it's a work for, for hire project that I got to do. And it's a, it's a kid's book. Well, it's um, geared for... 6th to 12th graders, but written at a 3rd to 4th grade level, so they call it high interest, low reading level. Um, and it was just kind of a neat thing to do. It's, it's kind of a, uh, you get involved in this thing and it's, it, they do a really, it's a really quick turnaround. I wrote it in um, maybe four weeks, including all the research I had to do for it. Um, I got COVID in the middle of writing it. That was really fun. <laughs> Nothing like a little brain fog when you're trying to finish a project. Um, but I was just really excited to, to have something, an actual book with my name on it that's like in libraries and stuff for kids. So I just wanted to share that with you. So you need, you need to talk to Russ because he writes in a similar genre. Right, Russ? Yes. Exactly. Absolutely. So that's why we, we like to have these meetings so people can know what everybody's doing. And yes. Yes. I have finished another ghosted book, which I can't tell you anything about. Oh. However, <laughs> I just finished the last draft of my own memoir, and I'm working on the proposal. Cool. So, uh, Leave, Leave Hoagland is uh, one of our previous presidents, so this is kind of fun that she's now going into another phase. So, anyway, thanks, Leave. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, well, Yes. Uh, Labor Day weekend, there's a big Street Writers Conference in San Diego. Jen and I will both be on the panels. Jen will be on one on Thursday. I'll be one on one Sunday. It's a called Voucher Club. Oh, cool. But Jerry will be there too. Very cool. And that kind of full circle, because that's where I, I met Janet and Will, was that uh, they were on a panel for a mystery thing in Cerritos Library. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I am going to now give the microphone over to is Aline Simons, and she's going to tell you some stuff. Here comes stuff. 
Our college job. So we have to check, do the checklist here and upcoming events and membership drive. So I'll do the upcoming events first in order to tempt you to renew if you haven't already. <laughs> Next uh, month, we will be on Zoom. There's a special event here in Heritage Hall. So we are going to be on Zoom that one month. Um, we will be sending you, it's kind of like pandemic revisited. We'll be sending our members and visitors uh, a link to the Zoom meeting. It will come to your email. And you all know how to do that, I think. <laughs> We've been there before. And that will be Lori Stevens, and she'll be talking about branching beyond a thriller series. She's another person who's probably going to be at Bouchard, right? Um, in October, Christina Laporte, who has a very interesting background in the medical field, has written the thriller, but also is a th uh, thriller writer. Mm -hmm. So it combines her background in medicine with the thriller genre. Mm -hmm. And her talk is called My Journey to Publication, no luck involved. In November, Pat Spencer on Yes, You Can Traditionally Publish Your Work Without a Literary Agent. In December, our holiday party, which will be hanging out and having snacks and probably a little open mic, which we usually do, and just kind of having a nice time, a nice holiday get together. And that's our program through the end of the year. And we'll have an update for you for the uh, 2024 um, in due course. So now I'll just jump over to a reminder about dues. And thank you for about 30 of you who've already renewed, actually. Um, but those who haven't yet, our renewal for current members is 45 a year. And we do need it by latest, latest, the 15th of September in hand, because on October 1, our whole system refreshes itself. But it's an electronic system that we don't really control. I mean, we do our own back door work here, but so we're saying September 15th for a deadline, please, at the latest, because we need to process it. So we would appreciate renewals as at your earliest convenience, and it can be by check or cash or on PayPal on our website. Um, we've said that it was down today, not the website, yeah. but the PayPal. But I have had renewals this week, so I know it's generally working. It's on our website on the dues renewal tab. And there are handouts at the table that just detail this, where to send the check, and so forth. And also our website, in case you've forgotten, which is uh, calwriterslongbeach.org. Um, so thank you again for those who've renewed, and thank you in advance for those who are going to renew. And thank you for those who've joined, including one today. Thank you very much. And we're really happy to see you all here today. So I think I'm switching hats again. So let me now introduce our speaker. Oh, little pieces of paper. With her very cool table and all her cool stuff over there. Jerry Westerson is the very successful author of several fiction series, ranging from historical mysteries to young adult. Or to state this another way, she writes across fiction subgenres from medieval Tudor, Sherlockian, LGBTQ mysteries to historicals and paranormals. Many readers are familiar with her first series featuring medieval detective or tracker named Crispin Guest. Courting Dragons launches her latest series, The King's Fool Mysteries, the sleuthing by the court jester of Henry VIII. Alita Becker in the New York Times book review wrote of Courting Dragons, little is known about Will Summers who became court jester to Henry VIII at the age of about 20 and held that position for the rest of his life which of course makes him irresistible to Jerry Westerson, who's already written a series of medieval noir novels, and Courting Dragons is the first new, first in a new series narrated by Will himself. A sprightly figure with a well-cultivated flair for gossip and a vigorously pansexual appetite, it's this latter that embroils him in the murder of a Spanish diplomat in a murky blackmail scheme, as well as a possible plot to kidnap Princess Mary. Quote, the court was full of gap dragons, Will observes, which dragons must I slay to protect Henry, and which to protect myself? So that was Alita Becker in the New York Times book review. Another of her recent titles, which she has a banner for here, is The Isolated Seance, 
an irregular detective mystery, and I love the tagline, without Holmes, they're clueless. <laughs> so how does Jerry do it? Not only is such a creative and productive author, but one moving through different genres, how does she reach her potential readers? So today she'll talk about from historical mysteries to modern marketing, and we're sure to take away some tips, inspiration, and probably a few laughs. Please help me welcome Jerry Westerson. And I thank you. <laughs> Uh, who am I and why am I? I don't know. Um, I, I like writing historicals. I like uh, traveling through history. And uh, I like research. And if you're going to write a historical, you'd better like research because you'll be doing a lot of it. So it's just like homework, just like school, but only more fun because there's, well, there's a little deadline, but not too much. <clears throat> so if we can go to the next slide. I've got two new series. The Crispin Guest Medieval Noir series is over at 15 books now. Um, so I told that complete story and I'm happy with it. And then I decided, well, I gotta do something else. Uh, so I, it seems that I like high concept things. The, the medieval noir is kind of high concept. We have a, a medieval detective in a noir setting and he's uh, not called the detective, he's called the tracker. But he does essentially the same thing, only in a sort of the, the dark, the mean streets of 14th century London. Uh, so I continue that idea of high concept with uh, the first in my new series, Courting Dragons, The King's Fool Mysteries. And that's Henry VIII's time period. And this is the real court jester of Henry VIII, Will Summers, who I have telling the story in first person and sort of breaking the fourth wall a little bit because it's a fool that's telling you the story so there's a lot of comedy in that also serious things people are killed and he has to reluctantly solve those crimes um and the the second one is the isolated seance my in an irregular detective mystery the um the the conceit of that is that my detective is a former Baker Street irregular. It's not about his fiber intake. That's not why he's irregular. Uh, he was a Baker Street irregular, all grown up, and opens his own detective agency with his friend Ben Watson. No relation to Dr. Watson. Um, so, so why why write historicals uh, when you're writing mysteries? Why do that? Well, for one. Um, Historicals, by the way, Historical Novel Society says that a book that's set, set at least 50 years ago from today is now historical. So I hate to break this to you, but the 70s is now historical. <laughs> so that doesn't make you feel old. I don't know what does. Um, but uh, so <laughs> I apologize for that. Uh, so there's many chances to extend your audience because of the historical aspect of it. So if we can see the next slide. Now, you may all remember this movie. It's one of my favorites, The Court Jester, Danny Kaye. Uh, wonderful music, very clever songs. Not one shred of historical accuracy to it, but we still remember it and we still love it. Uh, so those people who, who are interested in the Tudor period, and I was banking on that, and Henry VIII, everybody loves Henry VIII. Um, people who like the Tudor period, people who like the medieval Renaissance time period. Uh, this is what audiences like about this. Uh, the Reformation, uh, the dissolution of the monasteries. Henry VIII took over from, being, from the Pope and is now the, the, uh, the Pope in England for all intents and purposes. Dissolved the monasteries, took the land. Um, you can see the next slide. And of course, he's a lady killer, <laughs> quite literally. <laughs> so, um, people are fascinated by this time period, uh, particularly Anne Boleyn. They love Anne Boleyn. I don't know why she tried to break up his marriage, did break up his marriage, 
anyway, th there's a whole slew of people interested in just Anna Boleyn. So to have her in at least two of the books uh, is good for me. So that's, it, that's, besides the mystery, you also have your history. So the next slide. <clears throat> and now we have the isolated seance. There's, it, the audience for that are people who like Sherlock Holmes because he is in the story. He's, he's, they're Sherlock adjacent. It's not focusing on him. It's not changing the canon. It's, we're just looking at some of his Baker Street irregulars grown up. Uh, people who like Victoriana, the 1890s. Um, people who like um, trains, horse carriages. Next slide, please. Um, the Industrial Revolution. Uh, Penny Dreadful, spiritualism, that was a very big thing then. It came over from the United States and uh, it took hold in England. They loved it there. Um, opium dens, all of those things that can capture your imagination. Because the Victorian age, remember, is from 1837 to 1901. That's how long she reigned. Now think about Dickens, also this time period, from 1836 to 1870. So people who are interested in all of these things, you're giving more people a chance to say, well, I think I'll try this book. I think I'm gonna pick this up. So that's what we like. And let's go to seven, yes. So research, it all begins with research. Um, and, and you do, as I say, have to be very interested in doing that. Now because this is a mystery and it's not just an historical novel. Sometimes historical novels, you get a little leeway. You get a couple of years to write that because the research takes time. Um, now, I have a lot of uh, initial research about the Tudor period and the Victorian period already in my pocket. So it just needs a little fine tuning with specific research to that particular story. Maybe the people that are gonna be in it. I need to, to, to research those guys especially. Um, and actually what got me interested in writing the Sherlockian story is I previously wrote a Gaslamp steampunk series, which is over there, The Enchanter Chronicles. And, I, and be, even though it's paranormal, even though it's fantasy, I wanted to do my research on the Victorian period because you have to have this foundation for the reader in reality. Once you've got that foundation that they understand, then they'll go along with your fantasy. It'll all make sense because it's all meshing. So it was very important to do that, and I had a lot of fun writing it. So I thought, well, gee, what, what other kind of book could I write that's in this period? Huh, <laughs> high concept, Sherlock Holmes. Yes, let's do that. Um, so that's how that started. But basically, your research, your primary sources are where you begin. And primary sources are the stuff the real people wrote, like letters, uh, diaries, journals. Uh, it may be in other languages. For my uh, medieval series, particularly, uh, we have them in Latin, and medieval French, and Italian, and I don't speak any of those. <laughs> so I have to go to secondary sources, which are translations, uh, they interpret and analyze the primary sources by explaining and summarizing them. But sometimes that's still a little squirrely, so I usually have to go to tertiary sources. And that's someone else has done the work for you by collecting all the primary and secondary sources into an understandable narrative uh, with citations and a bibliography. Citations like footnotes, really important when you're researching. I get a lot of interesting stuff out of that. Uh, for one of, uh, it was a Crispin guest story, uh, I saw in the footnotes, because I was looking for um, who, in, in London, because the books are all set in London, uh, how did most people die in medieval London? And it told me that um, a lot of women drowned, because they were the ones getting the water, fetching the water, uh, going to the water sources, and you know, they fall in. And the men died by falling out of windows. <laughs> so I thought, what? <laughs> Gee, I, wonder what. I, I think I'm gonna look this up. 
Why are they falling out of windows? And there's such a word for that, defenestrate, because it happens so often in history. Um, so why do the men fall out of windows? Well, in London, instead of, instead of going outward to build your buildings, because that land belonged to somebody else, lots of bishops and such, they went upward. So they have second and third floors. And if you lived on the third floor, sometimes there was no stairway for you. We had a ladder. So if you're maybe drunk when you go to bed and you get up in the middle of the night to uh, see to a call of nature, you're not going to go down that rickety ladder. You're simply going to open the shutters. And But sometimes those guys misjudge all the way to the ground. So literally caught dead with their pants down. So that was from a footnote. <laughs> and, and I haven't used that in the book yet, but you know, it, it's, it's there in the you back of my to, head. I do have to, <laughs> truly. So, and one of the other things about uh, research <clears throat> is if you are in a period like the medieval or something very foreign to you and maybe your readers, um, sometimes children's books are a really good place to start. And these uh, Dorling Kindersley uh, eyewitness books are wonderful. They have all these huge photos, wonderful photos from museums, all the explanations. I mean, it's just a, it's just a quick synopsis rundown of the period showing you other things you need to research. But they're a good idea, and uh, I, I have found them very useful. I obviously don't stop there. It gives you a bibliography as well, and so that helps you get the, the books that you need to research. So, Other sources for research, and this goes for anything you're writing, not just historicals, but anything you're writing. You're, you guys are, are writing now a historical 1962. That's, that's historical. So, um, so newspaper archives online, most of you probably know about that. Uh, all kinds of newspapers. Some you have to pay for, some you can get a few for free. Um, but if you uh, go to Google Books, that's also something you can research if you can't get the book in a, a library, university library. You can go to Google Books. <coughs> now, they, they don't let you read the whole book. Um, they, they, you can get like maybe 10 pages read and then it'll stop in the middle and say, well, that's enough. You can get maybe the next 10 pages, but you can't get it all at once which is fair because that we had a big fight with Google to say, hey, you can't post our books online. So, but if you log out and log back in, sometimes you can get those missing pages. <laughs> All the tricks. But anyway, uh, listservs, uh, I, I belong to Medieval. L. Uh, it's the oldest listserv on the internet, actually. And uh, it is full of scholars, historians, and professors of medieval history and they know it all. Now usually, when you go on one of those listservs, you don't go charging in and start asking your questions without doing any kind of research, you will be flamed. You will be burned badly, <laughs> so don't do that. Go to them after you've lurked for a while and then ask your question. Make sure that you can't find it easily someplace else. Ask your question. Usually the questions I'm asking them is, what books are best for researching period A, B, C, whatever I'm looking for. And they will tell me, uh, giving good recommendations. Because not, the, not all, not all ha historical texts are created equal. Anytime something is a popular book about history that ends up on the bestseller list, don't use it. <laughs> it's full of inaccuracies. It's full of biases. Don't look at those. Go to an expert, ask them what the best books are to research. Um, we also have university libraries. You can't usually, I can't anyway, usually go to my normal local library to do my research to find the books that I want. So I, I'm not too far from a university, and you can go there. You don't have to pay anything if you don't check the book out. You can go there freely, go look in their stacks. You could actually online first, look and make sure they have that title or the titles that are what you want. You can go there, get the book, read it while you're there, or if you pay a little extra, you can check it out. Now, 
they, when, when you check it out, uh, they tell you if a student wants that book, you have to immediately turn it back in. Now, I live in the Inland Empire, oh. and um, my, my local is U UCR, University of Riverside, and no one has ever asked for a medieval book, <laughs> which is fine. But uh, you do have to be careful about that. And when I, when I signed up, uh, it had all these different titles. You know, they wanted to, you know, Mr. and Mrs., but all these other titles. And, and they said, um, and I said, do, do I need a title? And they said, sure. They said, well, you don't need one, but do you want one? I said, I guess. Yes, I think I'll be Admiral Jerry Westerson. So now I get, when I get the mail from them, it's to Admiral. <laughs> so I think it's hilarious. Yes. Mm -hmm. So if you go, all you get a stack of books and newspapers, and you don't have to invest into the aisles. But it's fun because <laughs> you find more things. So also the OED.com, uh, Oxford English Dictionary for word origins. Um, that's particularly important for me or when you're doing anything historical. You want to make sure that the words you're using are accurate to the time frame. Uh, for instance, in the Tudor period, I would not have a character say that that was mesmerizing because Dr. Mesmer was around in the 1700s, not the 1500s. So I don't want, I mean, is that a make or break? Well, for some readers it is, but I like to keep it accurate, and particularly idioms. I'm really bad at that. Uh, you know, um, dead as a doornail. You know, is it American? Or is it English? So I have to make sure that that's correct. Dead as a doornail is a perfect one for me because when did you first see Dead as a doornail? Anybody? Christmas Carol. Christmas Carol. That may be the first place you saw it, but it's not the first place it showed up. 1300s is when they first said Dead as a doornail. And Shakespeare used Dead as a doornail. So it's kind of perfect for me. I could use Dead as a doornail all the time because it's Tudor and it's also... Victorian, and we use it today, so that's kind of a handy thing. Okay, so uh, there are other internet archives. There's also other lift ser serves. There's a Victorian one that I'm using now as well. So any anytime you need something, you can probably do that. Yeah. Is list serves this? I should know the answer, but I don't. Is list serves something you pay for, or do you just? No, usually you sign up for it, and then you'll you get all the emails from all the people talking about the particular topics or posing particular topics, or you can pose a particular topic. And again, you can ask the, the experts that are on that, well, what's the best book for this, or where can I get a you know, gas lamp in the right time period, or anything like that. So yeah, they're on the internet, just just Google listservs for whatever your genre okay. might be. That yeah, okay. would be very helpful. Thank you. Okay, any questions about the historical part of this talk? <laughs> Who else is writing any historicals? Oh good, there's a lot of people. So were some of these things, th things you already knew about, that's good. Really helpful. So that's really good. Helpful. All right, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about marketing. I hope you've got notes to take here because sometimes I talk fast. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> marketing. The problem with marketing, the problem with writing a book is marketing it. <laughs> And you have to do it. I mean, I, I'm published with, I have been published with a big New York publisher, a big, uh, well, medium-sized um, UK publishers, my publisher now, small publishers, self-published. It's always the same problem. How do you get discovery? How do you get people to discover your books? And I wish there was an easy answer to that, but there isn't. And a lot of it is just a lot of elbow grease. And one of the things that you got, want to do is, uh, what you need to do is make a list of blogs, okay? Maybe you blog, maybe you don't. It doesn't seem to matter these days if you do or not. And when I started 15 years ago, everybody had to have a blog. But now they're sort of a little passe, except for a few people who are really excel at it. So you need to make a list of the blogs that focus on your genre, the thing you're writing about. If you're writing about a cooking mystery or some kind of other um, uh, book, 
uh, about kids or fantasy, what you want to do is focus on those on the internet. Just start finding them. You should probably know already if you're networking. Um, look at the, po at the blog, see if they allow for guest posts. Maybe they even review books. But make sure that they do guest posts. And, and how do you get a list of blogs? Well, you go to a pretty good one, a good size one, one that's well read by lots of people, lots of people going to that blog. And there's always a blog roll on the side in the margin. Those are other blogs that this blogger particularly likes. So that means they're quality. And that's your ticket to all of the other blogs. You go to each of those blogs. Some of them don't take guest posts at all. But if you've got a book that's published, you're going to want to have it on a, you want to do a, a little mini blog tour. <clears throat> Uh, you're going to be a good guest, by the way. Uh, and that means uh, you're going to supply them with an individualized blog post. If you get 30 blogs, I did this one year, don't ever do that again. Uh, I had to write 30 individual blog posts because you can't just post the same blog post 30 times on different blogs. That's not the point of this. The point of this is to get people interested in you and your book. So it has to be different, and here's a big word, and write down, write down this word and circle it really hard, content. You're supplying them with free content, and they love that. Because if you're a blogger, you know you have to produce some kind of blog post all the time, every day to get people really interested in coming back a lot. So you're providing them with this free content. You're gonna see that coming up a lot here. So um, by the way, do not waste your money on a blog tour package. Do not pay somebody. They're never good. I don't care who tells you how wonderful it was. A lot of these blog companies will begin their own blogs just to post your stuff on it. And you'll see them, you'll know what they look like. All they have are blog posts about this book is released, here's a giveaway, da 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 da. All the whole blog is that. That's useless to you. Don't do that. Don't waste your money. Network like you're doing and get to know people that have blogs. And, or just research that, as I said, with your whole list of, of blogs and make sure that you get good blogs. Uh, okay, yeah. How do you know if it's a good blog? Well, if, if there's a lot of people, sometimes they have a count of the people that visit the blog, and that's a good way to, okay. to tell. Um, if they're a, f a famous author, that's, that's a good way. Or um, there's groups of authors that do a blog. Um, I only do like two blog posts now on, on a tour, a blog tour. Uh, one is Jungle Red Writers. They're made up of five or six really top-end um, mystery authors. And I know them through networking, so they'll always have me on there. And another one is another historical blog from another historical writer and editor that I know. So those are my two blog posts now. Uh, and uh, yeah, I don't, uh, I, I, I just want to spend a lot of time doing that, but it's good to get your name, your book, mentioned on the internet as many times as possible. <clears throat> so, the very basics. These are the things you have, you should have. I was really shocked the other day when I made a banner for uh, my panel at BoucherCon, and uh, this, it's a Sherlockian panel, uh, and it's with Les Klinger who did the last annotated Sherlock Holmes three books uh, series. Uh, Lori King, I don't know if some of you have heard of her, and yeah. So I'm going to be on a, blog, on a panel with them, and there's another couple of other authors there. And one, I was trying to get a photo of her. She didn't have a website. Said, no, 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 that's amateur hour. You need a website. Um, you need to buy one in your domain, domain main, name. Uh, you need to have it, well, 
Jerry Westerson, the, I'm the only Jerry Westerson on the planet. So, and I, and so I can have jerrywesterson.com, which I do. But if you're Jane Smith, you're in trouble. So you need to be Jane Smith author, author Jane Smith, a Jane Smith writer, something like that. It should be your name as close to your name without a lot of you know, verbiage as you can. Uh, pay for it. Uh, you're telling me, oh, I don't have anything to put on it. I, I've not published it. Well, you got a name. You got a place of birth. You got a hometown. You got a couple of things that you could probably write about. Um, but it's it's a kind of a placeholder until other things come along. So <clears throat> become a member of writing organizations for questions, advocacy, networking. Well, congratulations, you are. <laughs> You belong to this club, and it's a big one. So uh, that's a good way to network. I don't know how it is connecting with other chapters, but it's you know it, if you could do that, maybe there's somebody in one of these chapters that has a great blog or something like that. Uh, other social media: Facebook, TikTok, Instagram. Know your hashtags. Know your hashtags. Do we know what hashtags are? It's a little little pound sign in front of a word. And those words and or phrases are very important because if you put book talk on TikTok, people that go to book talk and go down the list will see your post. And so if you do post something on Facebook or other, other social media, hashtag new release, book party, giveaways, you know, all those things are things people are looking for, so they look for those hashtags first, and then yours shows up on that whole list. So that's why it's important to put as many on there as you possibly can think of. It'll start to occur to you. Uh, vlog, um, you can do a, a video blog. Um, I have a YouTube channel. I put my um, book trailers on that. I, I have book trailers. Uh, that are as close to movie trailers as I can get, which means it's not just a slideshow. There's your book, there's a background, there's some type text about it. No, they got to, there's a narrator, and there's music, and there's sound effects, and there's uh, original footage, and also stock footage, and stock photos. So it looks like something people want. Now, does it sell books? It sells a few books, but it's mostly added value. When you are talking about your book to other places, like blogs, uh, you've got this added value. And I do series book trailers, not just each individual book, because that's 42 trailers and I'm not doing that. <laughs> so I want it for the series, and then I'm done. One, I'm done. So I have a YouTube channel, and also during the pandemic, I did lots of little funny, humorous five-minute uh, snippets to post on there and so that, that keeps people coming back i have a few people subscribe to that jerry yes how do you how do you produce those blog videos well funnily enough my husband <laughs> is doing that now um he did he did all of mine and uh there's a little card you can pick up with his he hasn't got the website quite up yet but um probably in a week he will have it up and going but if you're interested yeah he he does it uh, I I would write I wrote the copy and then uh, found the music and he and I both found all the the stuff that goes with it. Um, is there a specific uh, program you would recommend for that sort of thing? Um, he uses I think he started with DaVinci, but now he's doing something with the Adobe Suite. So. Anyway, what I do recommend is, you know, you don't have to get my husband hired, but get somebody that knows what they're doing. Don't do it yourself unless you are an expert. <laughs> it's like don't, don't design your own covers if you're self-publishing. Get an expert. I started off life as a, as a graphic designer, and, when I, and it's painful for me to see some of these self-published covers, and you can always tell. Uh, you need an author photo. So, you know, everybody has a phone. You can have your, your spouse or your friend take a nice picture of you. And don't do one of these. <laughs> you don't need to keep your chin up. Uh, be in a, in a cool dark alley or something or some foliage behind you, something. 
And you don't need your full body either, just from here to about here, because somebody's going to crop it down to what they need anyway. But, uh, you know, get a, get a decent photo. And don't use a photo of you from 20 years ago, because I have to tell you, when I go to events with authors speaking, and, you know, you're used to that photo of them. From, they got dark hair, and they're thin, and then you show up, and you go, who is that person? <laughs> No, it should be recent, you know, I'm, I'm proud of my white hair. So, you know, get a recent photo, be proud of yourself. You need a bio, again, I've not done anything. Well, you got a place that you grew up and, you know, you can, maybe you've got some writing credits from somewhere, put that in there. You're gonna need a 25 word bio, a 50 word bio, a 100 word bio. So get used to, get good at writing those little bios. Uh, and when someone requests your information, like a publicist, or somebody who is going to do a blog for you, allow you to have space on their blog, when they ask you for something, don't refer them to your website. Go to my website, you can get it all there. No, 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 <laughs> bad writer. You need to get, if they ask you for something, you be the best person in the world and you give it to them right then and there. You give the bio, the photo, whatever, the cover of the book, because nobody wants to hunt for that information. I mean, especially me the other day looking for this author photo's website, no website. So give it to them when they ask, okay? Next slide. <coughs> Okay, whether you are published by a big publisher or a small publisher or a medium publisher, you're going to have to do a press release. You're just going to have to one of these days. So get used to doing them. Do them anyway. doesn't matter if your publicist at, your, at St. Martin's did it for you. Uh, I, I want to do it for my tour, okay? So uh, you're going to need this. So this is sort of a sample press release. Um, Author name, email, phone, website, that goes on the top just like a letterhead. Okay, so that, that's on there. But it, when it says for immediate release, you're letting them, obviously you're saying in the subject line, press release for whatever the name of the book is. For immediate release, and that means within that month, or within the next two weeks or, or something. You want it to be close to when they can publish something, because you don't want to, them to lose it. You want them to know right away, so immediate release. Give it some kind of snappy headline. And my snappy headline for this book was, Without Holmes, They're Clueless. So it gives you a little bit of an idea of, okay, there's Sherlock Holmes involved. Somebody's clueless. There's a little humor. So it gives them right away. Now, this first line says, Los Angeles. You're explaining the book in one paragraph. It says Los Angeles, California. Every time you have a newspaper article, that's the place that, that you're put, gonna put where it's happening. So uh, it's, it's that, uh, that, that fire story is happening in Los Angeles. Dateline, Los Angeles, you know, remember that stuff? But it's supposed to kind of also be where you are. Now I was born in Los Angeles and I lived there until uh, I was about six, seven years old. Uh, so I know Los Angeles. But if I'm writing to the Los Angeles Times, I'm not going to put Menifee, California. Where is Menifee, California? Well, it's in the Inland Empire. That first line, that first place, it's going to make it relevant to the newspaper. So if I send it to the Los Angeles Times or the Pasadena Star News, I'm from Los Angeles. <laughs> it's not quite a lie because I used to live in Pasadena and I used to live in Los Angeles, but you want it to be relevant to them. So it's a little lie because I don't live in those places anymore. If I'm sending this press release to <clears throat> the San Bernardino Sun newspaper, I say Inland Empire. Uh, if I'm sending it to, um, well, I had to send one to the Sacramento Bee because I went to Northern California to do an event for this book. And so I just put Southern California. <laughs> so they know I'm a Californian, you know, if they know you're, because it just makes them want to do this, okay? Um, second paragraph, a brief synopsis of the book. 
Number three, a book blurb from a familiar author, if you've got one. I always try to, well, I've been networking a long time, so I, I know big authors. So I try to get a blurb before, um, before my, my publisher takes it to press because they're going to want to put it on the cover or, or something. So uh, if you can do that, if you know people, it's not valuable to get uh, um, a blurb from any ordinary author. Uh, and if, if you ask me for a blurb, I will tell you politely no. Because I'm not important enough for that to be on your book. No one's going to know who that is. So, but if you've got one, put it in the press, in the press release. Uh, where's the book available and where will you be in the area, place, state, and time? This is the reason you're sending that press release. You're going to be in a library. Or you're going to be in a bookstore. You let them know. Um, then there's that brief author bio again. And here comes that content, free content thing. Feel free to use the sample content article below. You're giving them a free article. You're giving them content. Oh, and when you, have, when you send these to a, like a small weekly newspaper, they're going to love you because they need to fill those pages. And you're giving them a free article. Now, the bigger newspapers probably won't use it because they've got plenty of content. But they might put something. They might pull one of your, your uh, quotes out of there because these articles are about you. You're interviewing you. It's as if a newspaper person a journalist was interviewing you, that's what you're gonna write. Free content. So get used to doing that. You can Google all of this and, and take a look at, at press release templates and all of that and sample articles and things. Go ahead and look at that and make sure that you get that in your head because you will need it. I send those out every time a book is releasing. So when it's releasing and when I'm going out to, to release it into the world. Okay, next one. Online events. I know we're a little tired of that, <laughs> and Zooming and all that, but uh, I was doing this before the pandemic. I want you to know. Um, I used to do Facebook events. I had my, um, one of my launches on Facebook as an online event. But I realized two things. One, people who aren't on Facebook can't go, even though Facebook told me they could. They can't. They don't have an account. They can't go. And number two, Facebook is kind of a jerk. And sometimes some of us authors who have a big mouth end up in Facebook jail. <laughs> and then we are restricted on what we can post. And if it happens to fall on the date I'm doing an event, I am screwed. So I don't do that anymore and I don't buy their ads. So. <laughs> Um, but I decided to do that on YouTube because anybody can go to YouTube and if they're late and they didn't make it, it's recorded so they can watch it later. So that's nice. I mean, I do all the full thing. Now you have to be comfortable. You have to be comfortable um, talking to yourself for an hour. Uh, talking about the book, talking about the history that's in the book, whatever you're going to be talking about. And I do giveaways. And I, I tell people, you know, I'll do this at the end of the thing so that I don't want to interrupt anything because I'll just be sitting there silently looking at emails. So I just have them email when they request uh, the giveaways. And I use a random number generator that picks the name. So I do that later. <clears throat> but um, I do a reading, I do giveaways, a history, how I came to write the book, etc. Um, now I say up there, forget bookstores, uh, target libraries, but bookstores are very valuable. Especially independent right. bookstores are very nice to you. Not so much maybe Barnes & Noble, Gatsby but Gatsby's in Long Beach is very friendly, and they have a cat. So <laughs> I love them especially for that. So, but you can't always go to, to bookstores and they're not always available, there's not a space available. I always try to book it six months in advance. So Jeff will be hearing from me soon, Sean. Um, libraries are great resources. Again, you're offering them content, free content, right? Um, libraries, uh, they like to have 
people, authors coming in and do events. Um, but I'll talk about that in, in detail later. But also, you want to market to libraries. Because when a book goes to a bookstore from the publisher, that is not a sale. Not until money has passed over their desk from a reader, right? That is not a sale. Those books can go back. But a library, once they buy it, they got it. And if people check it out a lot and the book gets old and crumbly, you have to buy another one. <laughs> so uh, libraries are great resources. People love to go to libraries. They love to read books from libraries. Some people cannot afford some of the expensive uh, books now. Hardcovers are kind of outrageous. Some of the ebooks are a little high, I think. Uh, all the authors complain about that from their publishers. So a library is a great place. So you want to make a list of libraries. You're going to be making a lot of lists. Elbow grease, OK? Basic list of libraries throughout the country. Well, you're wondering, oh, how do I do that? Well, each state has a capital. So each capital will have a library. So that's at least 50, but you want to delve a little deeper. Uh, go to maybe a favorite town of yours from one of the, from out of state, um, and just make this list. And then there's two other words I want you to understand, I want you to remember. Variable data. Variable data. That means uh, when you go to some place like Kenko's, or I go to Vistaprint now, they seem to do a very good job at a decent price. When, when the Vistaprint gets my artwork for a postcard, they print the front, and then it goes to the press, and they print the back, and they print an address and a stamp. Boom. An address and a stamp. Boom. Different addresses. There was the day when I had 600 postcards and I printed out the labels for all those libraries, and I had rolls of stamps, label, stamp, label, stamp, la don't do that to yourself. Just pay for that. Pay for the variable data. So variable data means you're supplying them not only the artwork for the postcard, but an Excel doc of the addresses that is they're gonna be sending it to. So the addresses have to be in a particular template and it tells you how to do that. And once they're there, that's great. You're, you're done, one and done. Uh, they'll, they print all of that, and then they'll just mail it out. You're paying for this mailing. You get a little deal, and they mail it out. So very important. Um, those sales are, let me tell you, they, they make the difference. They make a difference. Because whether you're publisher or you're self-publishing, if you're self-publishing, you can do this too, you know. I did, because I do both. So make sure you do that. I guess we're the next one. When you have an event, what to bring? What to bring to any event? Well, as you can see, I like to bring props, because props are an icebreaker. People get to look at stuff and touch them. I, when I did my medieval noir series, I brought a sword and I brought armor. People got, you know, can I, can I touch the sword? All the women were, can I touch the sword? And all the men were going, <laughs> I'm King Arthur, you know? So yeah, they, it's, people love that stuff. So it, it sets the mood and you're giving them something to, to talk about and look at. Um, that little picture in the corner, that was what I had for when I did my Book of the Hidden series. It's an urban fantasy. And um, that was fun. People love to see that stuff. So props. Props are always good. Bookmarks. You need bookmarks. Again, the Vistaprint, uh, you got two sides. So use those two sides. Have them designed by somebody who knows what they're doing. Um, giveaways. I always have like little pens or um, I have little night ducks, K-N-I-G-H-T, ducks. Um, I gave those away for the medieval books. With the Tudor books, I had little um, little uh, jester ducks, rubber ducks. Why not? People love them. Rubber ducks. I could not find any Sherlock Holmes rubber ducks that weren't just big ones that were expensive. Not little ones. I don't get it. But anyway, um, posters, pull-up banners, anything that you 
you have the, that will show you who, who you, you know, show, that, show them who you are. Um, Nosh, if it's allowed, it's a library. So you gotta ask, if, is it okay if I bring cookies, you know. Um, and books for sale, if allowed. Sometimes you can get a bookseller to sell the books. Sometimes you can't. But if they allow you to sell books, this is a good idea. Now, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do when you get to the, one of these events? It's not gonna be a hard sell. You're not gonna talk about your book and all the hard work you went into. No, you're gonna take an aspect of the book and you're gonna talk about that because you're providing general audience content. So it has to be interesting to a wide variety of people. When I did my uh, tutor book, I talked about the history of jesters. So that was interesting to a wide variety of people. Um, when I talk about this book, it's Sherlock Holmes, and I do a little quiz, and we have a little, you know, little tete-a-tete. -tete. So something, something that's not a hard sell, something about the book and where it was written or something. Or especially if you relate to, if you particularly relate to that book, maybe you travel to that location, you can do a little slideshow uh, of, you know, Ireland or something. So that's always fun. Now, should you buy ads? All right. Um, all these ads, Kindle, TikTok, uh, BookBub programs for uh, conventions, Amazon, think of them all as direct marketing. What is direct marketing? Well, you all get it in your real mailbox at home. We call it junk mail. That's direct marketing. Now, what a, a, a seller thinks, say they buy, they send 10,000 pieces of direct mail to a neighborhood. Maybe they do carpet cleaning. I always get those. I have no carpets. I have old wood floors, so I immediately toss it. So 10,000 pieces of mail go out. Now, maybe 400 people are slightly interested in that. Oh, I guess we'll save this in case we need it. And out of those 400, um, 100 people are going to call this company and hire them. So for 10,000 pieces of mail, they get 100 sales. And that's good enough for them because it keeps it coming through. Now, same deal. Uh, you, when you buy these ads, you're getting impressions and clicks. The impressions means people who see that ad, who spend more than a couple of seconds looking at that ad. So they name, they count that down. The clicks are people who look at that ad and actually click through to the buying page. Now, do they buy that book? We don't know <laughs> because, I mean, all the analytics in the world are not going to tell you those specifics. It's not going to tell you how many people are buying that book. Because people will look at that and go, I like this book. Oh, I don't have the 30 bucks right now to buy the hard guard. I'll, I'll wait, I'll, I'll think about this the next time. Either they write it down or they don't and forget it. But, so out of 4,000 impressions of people looking at it, you might get 47 clicks. And maybe out of those 47, you'll get 10 people that buy the book. So what I'm telling you is, Yes, do some advertising, but don't spend a fortune. Do not spend a fortune. If, you get an, if you're lucky enough to get an advance from a publisher, do not spend it all at one place. Okay, so the Kindle one is pretty good. For 40 bucks, that's a reasonable price, uh, you can get it on the Kindle. So basically what's happening is whatever genre you choose that your book is in, when somebody has a book in that genre, it's gonna, your ad's gonna come up when they open the Kindle. Because they already know those people like those kinds of books. And they might just click on it and order it right then and there because it's right in their face. So that's a good deal. BookBub is a really good place. Um, again, 40 to $60. Don't spend more than that. You won't need it. You, you won't get more for it. So again, impressions and clicks. TikTok, right now, uh, I just did my uh, two book trailers on it. 
Uh, I got 10,000 views pretty quick on the Tudor one. Uh, the other one, the, this one, I think that got like four, no, 6,000 uh, views. Uh, so you can choose, do you want likes or do you want uh, people to go further to the buying option? So TikTok is one. Uh, I put an ad in the VoucherCon uh, program. I always usually put an ad in those. Those are pricey. Those are usually like 350 or something like that for a small, very small quarter page ad. But I do that because I'm usually only on one panel. I don't know why, I'm hilarious. But anyway, um, <laughs> you should only get one panel. So this is an opportunity because people are carrying around that program everywhere. They're carrying it all day. They're looking at the schedule. They're looking at the next things. They're looking at the, all the other stuff that's in the program. And they're going to see your ad multiple times. And so they might go to the bookstore and go, well, let's see if I got something at the bookstore at the convention. So I always do that. But now there's a, there's a free thing, it's free for now, it may change, but it's, it's called Am Free Amazon Plus Banners. Now if you self-publish, you can put a banner or, or multiple banners on your page, on the page of that book. It, and it has to be specific to the book and it can't there, there's a lot of rules about it, so you're going to have to mess around with it. But it's free. I told my publisher about this, and he just got, the, by the marketing um, department got really excited, and they did a bunch for the tutor book. What does it do? It keeps people on the page looking at your title, and it gives them different things to look at. You could put uh, quotes uh, from reviewers and stuff like that on it. Uh, keeps them on the page. <laughs> Um, so it's free. You want to keep those eyes on there. Free content for you. Okay. Uh, yeah. Guess that's it. Last one is for general questions. Yeah. <laughs> I gave you a lot of information. I know I did. <laughs> I loaded you up with all kinds of stuff. Your mileage may vary. Some things may be better for you that work for me, and you know, I've tried it all, it seems like, but anyway, yeah. So I just had a follow-up regarding the libraries. Mm -hmm. um, do you send them a free copy, or how do you get them interested? I send them a postcard. Because <laughs> they're, you know, and, and now people are anxious to publish, and a lot of people self-publish, and I will ask you not to do that. Um, don't self-publish first. Try to get yourself a publisher. You're only a debut author once, and they will make a big deal out of you. They will spend extra bucks, promotional bucks on you. So try to, it takes years. It took me 14 years to get published with St. Martin's, a big New York publisher. So, and I'm glad I did. After that, it's okay to start self-publishing, but you, you're gonna have an agent, and you're gonna get publishers, multiple publishers probably in this day and age. Um, but you need, you need that, that to get your name out. Because when you are published by a publisher, traditional publisher, uh, they will get you reviewed in the top four industry magazines. Kirkus, Publishers Weekly, Library Journal, and there's a library journal, a school library journal, and um, what did I leave out? Book list. Okay? And those go to the libraries. Usually Library Journal does. It's in the name. Um, but uh, they will look at these things and they will see what the reviewers have to say about it. Plus, your publisher will send out a catalog with your book in it. So when the acquisitions librarians are looking through that too, they're saying, oh, well, this is from a reputable uh, publisher. And I guess it's worth getting, you know? So you want, you want to start there. I, I know it's hard, I know you're impatient. Please wait. <laughs> Please work hard, get an agent. It's harder today than it ever was. 
Um, get an agent so you can get to those big publishers. Just a follow-up. Do the, do the smaller publishers, are they also included in these lists to the libraries? Yes. Because they're the ones that will get they they will get them into these these magazines for review, and I know you can pay for reviews and publishers Wiggly and Kirkus and all. These. Don't do that. Don't waste your money. Everybody will know you bought it, so don't do it. But um, that's why you really traditionally published. And there are some people, some a very small percentage of people who make money in certain genres, self-publishing. Probably not you. <laughs> okay. I have a basket question. Um, on the uh, having a literary agent or just going straight to the publisher, there's times when you have to have a literary agent because publishers are closed. Right now, publishers are open. Mm -hmm. And so you don't need a literary agent. Can everybody hear her question? Yeah. Okay. What is the benefit of having or not having a literary agent? The benefit of having a literary agent is first thing they'll do is look over the contract. And if there's some muzzy things in that contract that aren't great for you, like they're gonna retain the audio rights, they're gonna, you know, whatever. Your agent will say, no, I think that we want her to have her own audio rights because now you can sell your books to audio publishers and get an advance, get more money. You're not going to get that if it's included in the contract. So they'll do that. They'll be the advocate for you and your career. Number two is they will get you foreign sales. They will get you those audiobook contracts. They will get you other stuff. Uh, get the book placed in other places. So it's better to have a literary agent, but if you can't get that and you can submit to some of these publishers, that are open, not all of them are, and now what we want in our contracts is that there is no AI making any of our covers. <laughs> that needs to be in everybody's uh, clause in everyone's contract. And if they won't do that, then, go, then say no. Have the courage to say no. Um, but th that's what you, your, your, your agent is your advocate, and is your, is your helpmate in your business. This is a business. You know, I know we like to think of it as art, but we're trying to make money here too. <laughs> so they, they don't have to be your best friend. You don't have to have them over for Thanksgiving. If they're a good business person, that's what you want. And that's why I guess the, the, it's, it's the, the list is getting smaller and smaller. Um, it's hard. The whole publishing industry is having issues, <laughs> to say the least. So I really recommend that agent first. But if you can get into a small publisher, or a medium publisher, or even a big one, try it. Go for it. So do you do podcast guest um, spots or anything like that? Yes. When somebody asks, I say yes. <laughs> do, you, do you reach out for that at all? For um, I, well... I have, uh, if I saw somebody like on Facebook and I got on this podcast, I said, oh really? Well, I'm going to find out about this podcast and sometimes I go right to them and then I get a, a slot. But sometimes I just, I'm just asked because I'm loud and noisy. Well, I was, um, I have belonged to, I belong to Sisters in Crime and Mystery Writers of America in Historical Novel Society. Uh, I've belonged to others before, but I have been on the boards of Sisters in Crime, and I was president of Mystery Writers of America of Southern California, and, um, and I was a founding member of the Historical Novel Society chapter in Los, in Los Angeles, Southern California. So I've networked with a lot of people, and so <laughs> they know who I am by now. And um, yeah, so I've gotten interviews and stuff that way. Network, network, network. I never believed in networking until I became a writer, because we are alone in our little room, making, typing away, making our stories, and we think we could do this alone. You cannot do it alone. You must do it with others. Network. They will. I, I have had book, uh, short stories published in several anthologies. I have tried to submit my short stories to other anthologies and was refused. 
But peop people know me, I've networked, they call me and say, would you like to be in this anthology? Yes, I don't like writing short stories, but yes, I will, <laughs> I'll go into this. And the latest one I was in was the Kashik Noir, their series of, of anthologies, and I got in there because I was asked. So, network. Is that Noir Riverside, or which one It's it? uh, South Central Noir, because I was born in South Central Los Angeles. So, there we go. Anything else? Yes, sir. Uh, when the, for first, for someone who has never been published before, when you're sending queries out to like literary agents, are there any details that you find people include that might turn a literary, a literary agent off from considering you, or something that they might that you probably should include, but that amateurs might want to, might not to include? Like, say, I know, like, just for example, I know uh, if you're a fan fiction writer, that's not traditionally not a, considered a very, you know, reputable thing. So like either include that or leave that out of your query letter. I would definitely leave that out. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they don't want to know that you're writing fan fiction. Although technically, yeah. <laughs> this is a pastiche, we like to call it, but that's essentially fan fiction. Um, that's a little different category, but yeah. yeah, you know, you don't want to be known for writing Harry Potter fan fiction yeah. or something like that. No, um, you, what people are as timid about is, is include, if you're asked, now don't send things that don't ask for, yeah. and you can try uh, querytracker.com, it's free, or you can pay uh, a monthly fee and get more, more stuff, more, I guess, views of different agents. Um, always look for the category that you write, don't send stuff to, you know, I would never send something to an agent that doesn't do historical mysteries. That would be dumb. I wasted my time. Um, uh, t if they ask you for a synopsis, you give them the full synopsis, including telling them the ending. <laughs> That's a big tell for an amateur. Is that, well, I don't want to tell them the ending. I want it to be a surprise. Well, no, they want to see that you can actually put together a story and conclude it properly. So... Don't do that. Yeah, so give them the full, give them what they want. The new thing today, though, is that they never, they don't seem to reply to you if they've rejected it. They, and it's just an email. It's an email now. Because uh, one of my favorite rejections was my query letter, you know, and I used to have to print it out and mail it with a stamp in those days. It was my query letter sent back to me in the self-addressed stamp envelope with a stamp that said, not interested. <laughs> and I kept that because I thought, okay. <laughs> well, I'm not interested either. So, but yeah, they don't seem to want to even respond to that. It's kind of rude. But I would definitely look online and see yeah. the different things that people are saying. And a uh, quick follow up. Um, I, I noticed, like, you know, they usually ask for a bio, and like you said, well, I've never uh, done anything. Uh, what details would you focus on to kind of, you know, pretty it up? Yeah, uh, maybe you've written for the school newspaper. <laughs> uh, some articles like that. Um, uh, prior to, uh, prior to my, well, I've, I've had four agents. I'm on my fourth agent. Um, it's a business. If they can, if the first three can't do it, the fourth one did. Um, when I started out, I didn't have any credits, so um, I started sending out spec articles to all kinds of quirky magazines that I knew needed content <laughs> that they would pay me for, uh, and I wanted to see if somebody would pay for my writing, because this was getting ridiculous. I was getting rejections for years and years. So I did have some of those things, um, not short stories, not articles. And then I got a job as a stringer for uh, local newspapers, two dailies and a whole bunch of weeklies. And so I was doing a lot of that when I had a toddler at home and he and I, we would go out and interview people. <laughs> um, but yeah, so if you can get something like that, if you can go out or there's online magazines, maybe you can get something published in some of those. Or just, you know, be truthful. Don't have anything yet. I'm working on a novel, uh, novelist career, doing this and that. Okay. 
or you can get published in the Southern California Writers Club Literary <laughs> Review. There you go. <laughs> that's an old one, but we do have. Uh, that's one of the values of being a member. Right. You can get, these are old, these are old, but you can get a byline. Yep. Um, and they're jury, so they don't accept jury. everything. So they are, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Even better. Yeah. Even better. Yeah. Yeah. Just a little pitch for the club. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Yes, sir. Uh, it sounds like you've been a full time writer for a pretty long time, I guess. Mm hmm. Not time. Have you ever had like a day job that you left because you needed to do full time? Yup. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a happy day. <laughs> um, yeah, I was finally, I was, you know, an office assistant. I was doing all kinds of other kinds of jobs. And, uh, you know, my husband supported me. And um, so it just got to the point where I told my husband, I said, look, you know, I think it's time to go full time on this. And, uh, and it was the second book that uh, from St. Martin's. So I was getting decent advances and decent royalties, so it was time to say goodbye. And I have not looked back. <laughs> so that, and that was 2009, something like that. Yes? I had two questions. One was, I just wondered what your uh, writing schedule was like. And the second one with the research that you do you do, or do you do all of it before you start, or do you do like a bulk and then some as you go along? I just wondered your process. I uh, write every day, holidays, weekends, and um, when I'm on vacation and <laughs> stuff like that. Um, I used to write eight hours a day, and I can't do that anymore. Not a long shot. <laughs> I'm too tired, I'm too distracted, I can't do it. Um, so, but I like to write first thing in the morning, I'm fresh in the morning. Um, first I take care of my, you know, any, any sort of correspondence because I got an agent in New York and a publisher in England. So I, I need to be there early <laughs> to catch them. Um, and then I write, and I write for a couple hours, and then I take a break, you know, have lunch, and, you know, watch some TV to decompress, get ideas, go back to it and write as long as I can, I try to, I have, I used to be a minimum of 10 pages a day, can't do that anymore, so now it's five. So I also demand that my, on my contracts, that I get nine months to write the book. Because for mystery writing, you have to produce a book a year, at least. So I've got to get it done in nine months. I usually get it done far earlier than that. <laughs> This is number two in this. That's, that's due in October. I'm done. I've been done a long time. So I get to really mess with it. <laughs> Fix it, write it, rewrite it. So I'm, I'm happy about that. I, I usually start the first month, solid month of researching the things I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, if I'm lucky to get three months, sometimes I can. Um, but then as I go along, I research. Because I will get to something down the page and think, oh, do they have that then? Is that something they knew about? And before, when I just said, oh, I'll research it later when I'm done. Big mistake, because if that's a crucial part of your mystery and it didn't exist, you are screwed. <laughs> so I research as I go. Because there's always something where somebody has entered the page and I said oh I don't really know much about them so I better go find out and inevitably inevitably when you research a person or something you usually get a new line of of um, plot it gives you ideas to add more depth to what you're writing so I, I don't mind that at all and uh, I rewrite also as I go along every day I rewrite what I wrote the day before gets me into the swing of it and then I can fix you know and then I can begin new the next day. When I finish a book, I start on the, because usually they're all, they're all series books. Um, I used to start on the second one right away, at least for the first 10 pages. And then I leave it. Because if once we're all done with the edits for the, the, bur the book that I finished, the edits and it's going to press, and then I have to think about marketing, and then it's time to sit down and write that next one. I don't want a blank page. 
<laughs> I may throw out everything I wrote, but uh, I don't want to start with a blank page. Do you use uh, what writing software do you use? Nope, I use Word. <laughs> <laughs> Word, that's what the publishers want. That's what they're going to get, and I, that's perfectly fine with me. I, I do a lot of, whoa, I do a lot of, uh, each book that I have, it ha I, has a, I have a spiral notebook about so big. Uh, that's my, my Bible for each book. And it's full of research, and it's full of scenes that I'm thinking about, dialogue. Um, and it's also my brainstorming session. Because I sit down, I write, well, this is where we are. Where are we going now? <laughs> And when I do that, when I physically write it out, it helps the brain move along and find ways to do that. So it's, it's good for all of those things. I have these wonderful little tabs that Avery makes. You get, and you can stick it on the page and, and, and you can take it off without tearing the page. So it's my, my notebooks have those tabs all over it so I know where I'm going, where I can find it. Some people love technology and they'll do it on an iPad or something. But you know, studies have shown that you retain more information if you write it out. Because you remember the way it looks when it's written. You remember where it is in the, the many pages you've got. You know where it is in the little spiral bound book, especially with a little tab on it. Um, you retain that information, so I do recommend that. I mean, you know. If you love, love, love technology and it really works for you, do that. But I'm telling you this is more helpful. The science says it's more helpful. Anything else? Somebody has some? Nope? Nope? I okay. think we owe a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.